Welcome to our last worship lab. This has been a really fun experiment, and thank you for joining us over these many months of a really weird time in our lives and in our world. It was really fun to have a space to share together, to be creative, uh, and to talk about things that were worth talking about. So I hope you enjoyed this last worship lab. I have to admit, I never really understood Advent. Like, what is the deal with Advent? Everyone else starts celebrating Christmas in November, but the church waits and waits and waits and waits and yearns for the birth of Jesus for four entire weeks. Why? Newsflash, the baby was already born. Over 2,000 years ago it happened. Can't we just celebrate that he came and was born and move on? Karl Rahner, a Jesuit priest, put these thoughts a little better than I did. He wrote, Every year we roll up all our needs and yearnings and faithful expectation into one word, come. And yet what a strange prayer this is. After all, you have already come. You have already shared our life with its joys, its long days of tedious routine, its bitter end. Could we invite you to anything more than this with our come? Could you approach any nearer to us than you did when you became the Son of Man, when you adopted our ordinary little ways? Most years I don't really need Jesus to show up, or at least I don't think I do. I don't really want God to do something new. I like the same old routine and nostalgia of Christmas. I like celebrating that Christ was already born so that I don't even expect that Christ might come today. But 2020 is different. This year I need Jesus. Badly. In the middle of a pandemic, in the middle of fear and anger, in the middle of worries and doubts, in the middle of fighting and disappointments, I desperately await Jesus' birth. And really, that's the truth of Christ's coming that I missed these last 30 advents of my life. It's not that Jesus' birth happened once and for all, but that it is happening now. In this moment and in every moment, Christ comes, and God does something new. Again, Karl Rahner shares this prayer. O God who is to come, grant me the grace to live now in the hour of your advent in such a way that I may merit to live in you forever in the blissful hour of your eternity. Welcome to Advent. Welcome to God doing something new. Welcome to the wonder. God of imagination, we confess that we often miss glimpses of you because it took, it looks too new. We like our lives and our comfort and forget to look beyond what we know to see where you may be leading us. Help us to see the new creation that you are always constructing. God of community, we confess that not everyone feels like they belong with us in this church and all churches. In refraining from newness, we dismiss many of the beautifully created humans you have made. Help us all know that we belong to you. God of compassion, we confess that we are too hard on ourselves. We look to find the perfect words, the perfect worships, the perfect performances, and forget simply to be in your presence. Help us remember to come to you with all our imperfections and pride. God of empathy, this has been a really hard year. We confess that we continually make things harder by losing faith and putting our trust in things that cannot truly sustain us. Help us remember the things and people that make us the best us possible. Help us see more of you in everything. The God of all good things reminds us that there is always new creation to explore, people to love, forgiveness to extend, and faith to lean on. 
God forgives us and all our mess, mistakes, and mystery. May we continue to explore and appreciate all the wonders God has given us. Amen. Amen. Our first song tonight is Vapor. I believe, and I didn't look it up, it was the first song we did in the first worship lab. Any diehard worship labbers out there <laughs> can correct us in the comments. Chasing of the wind, the powers of the earth, so pale and thin, we will set our hearts on you again.
A reading from Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their inequity and remember their sin no, no more. We called this Worship Lab because we wanted this to be a lab, a real space for experimentation, a real place to try new things, to look at things in a way that we are not used to looking at things, and hear a few new sounds along the way. Because it is a lab, and because anybody who has to take a lab in college or in high school knows you need to write a lab report when you're done to share your findings. So tonight you're going to hear four lab reports from the four of us who've been doing this worship lab for the last eight months and hope that if you learned a few things along the way, please feel free to share those in the comments as well. First up, Pastor Lisa. My lab report is entitled, An Experiment in Generosity. Mm. The next song we're going to sing in a little bit is called Generous Giver, Caitlin's favorite. Nice. As in prayer, we will sing to God in the words of this song that God is the generous giver, the conductor of generosity. Worship Lab, for me, has been an experiment in musical generosity. Mm. In late spring, this sanctuary felt flat, mm. off half of a note. Mm. More than feeling flat, the sanctuary was like a sheet of music in which a few notes here and there had been erased. Mm. The feel in the room was off. We were missing you, missing the musical sounds we make together. We were missing connection and familiarity and the fullness of who we are as the body of Christ. Prior to the pandemic, we hadn't planned for Worship Lab exactly. Peripherally, we had thought about something like it. We'd heard a desire for a greater variety of music, for something less formal and more tangible and more relevant. Yet, Overall, Worship Lab was an unexpected pregnancy and birth, which was a generous gift from the generous giver. Hmm. Ministry such as Worship Lab is born only when God aligns the gifts of God's people at the right time and place, as God generously did in this experiment. Pastor Joe was called to St. John, bearing gifts of music, your musical gifts on guitar and trumpet and banjo and maybe any instrument you get a little bit serious about. Mm. <laughs> they were more like secondary gifts to St. John. Your instrumental and vocal gifts were not the primary reason you were called here as pastor. And yet, little by little, the crescendo of your gifts has proclaimed the gospel mm. and created faith in Jesus Christ. Caitlin Blend also was not called here for music primarily. She was not called to be your faith formation director, director primarily because of her musical gifts. In fact, your musical gifts were kind of a secret at first. We heard bits and pieces on Wednesday nights where you led a very large crowd of people in camp songs week after week. And once in a while, the two of you, Kaylin and Carter, shared offertory music on Thursdays and Sundays. And then you sang in a sermon, which is incredibly courageous. Mm -hmm. 
You hired Caitlin, but you simply lucked out with her husband, Carter, all these weeks and months. (laughs) Your musical talent is much larger than you admit. You are a steady presence, Mm -hmm. like the allegro or the bright tempo Mm -hmm. to our gatherings. And then Chris Peterson arrived on the scene, the only one specifically hired here to sing, to play, to midwife the musical gifts God's generously scattered in this community of faith. Worship Lab would not have been born without her creativity and collaboration and hard work and deep faith in the words that we carefully crafted and the music we shared. And when Chris and her family moved to Arizona last summer, the familiar face of Roz pulled up a piano bench So you see how this works? God, the generous giver, orchestrates experiments in our midst all the time, bringing the right people to the lab at the right time. Tonight we enter the coda, the symbol that indicates to the musician the final passage is beginning. Our worship lab experiment will come to a close tonight, although not really. Now our learnings will become part of worship in other ways, ways that keep our music together as the body of Christ from becoming flat. Mm. So in conclusion, Mm -hmm. my findings in this experiment, fellow lab techs, is deep gratitude Mm -hmm. to the generous giver for musical generosity for all of you. Thanks, Lisa. I'll allow it, although I think it was more of a music report. (laughs) I can tell which classes that you were... uh, (laughs) More well-versed in. Excellent. If I had brought my safety glasses, I think I would be (laughs) more in a formal lab report mode. That's good. Carter. All right. My lab report title is Worship Lab Report. (laughs) (laughs) Now, that's a science. That's a science guy. Uh, My (laughs) hypothesis for Worship Lab was having a diverse mixture of music and setting plays a positive role in the overall impact of the worship message or theme. Mm. The methods that we used to experiment this were we introduced non-conventional music and settings into worship that related to the worship message and theme. Mm -hmm. We We used music with lyrics that defined the worship message and theme through song. We used instruments not typically heard in your traditional worship setting, such as a guitar or a cajon. And the noisy tube. And the noisy tube. (laughs) Uh, We changed settings and styles of environment to create a mood that related to the worship message and theme, such as we worshiped in our vehicle, uh, Mm -hmm. we worshiped around a campfire, Mm -hmm. and we also worshiped within our personal houses and homes. We also utilized different activities that brought more meaning and personal reflection of the worship message and theme, such as when we did the instrument gift exchange switch, uh, when Caitlin painted a picture during worship, uh, when we have meaningful dialect and conversations amongst us and you at home, and when we baked bread that one time. Um, So my results of this experiment is Uh, Worship Lab made worship unique and fun. Church can get quite redundant at times, knowing exactly what to expect and what to do. But with Worship Lab, we created mystery, anticipation, and wonder. We asked tough questions that really made you think about your own stance and opinions. And instead of singing from a hymnal with organ sounds backing you up, we brought new and exciting music each week, some things that people have heard and are familiar with, and others that people were hearing for the very first time, including us. Mm -hmm. We challenged the typical scene of worship, of sitting in pews and listening to the leaders say and do things, by placing ourselves inside the viewer's home and creating a comfortable and relaxing space to hear the message or theme. And we broke boundaries of the sanctuary and worshiped in vehicles, around campfires, and in our personal homes. And all these experiments taught the viewers and us that worship doesn't have to look like worship. Hmm. So in conclusion, (laughs) I believe that mixing worship up with different styles of music and settings can play a positive role in creating excitement within the congregation. 
No more same old, same old, but rather what's new, what's next. Attention to small details such as lyrics or candle placement could impact a viewer and convey the message or theme even better. With Worship Lab, you get all angles of experience while diving into current and d debatable topics, all while focusing on how God and faith are at the center of it, welcoming you to the wonder. Thanks, Carter. Oh, nice. nice job, scientists. A plus. <laughs> plus, plus, plus. All right. <laughs> uh, in Pastor Lisa's lab report, she mentioned Generous Giver, and that's our next song. Your mercy 
mercy overflows. Your blessing is a river, and on and on and on and it goes. You are an endless fountain, you're filling up my life. My heart is singing praises, Jesus, you are glorified. Caitlin, would you please share your lab report? Gladly. A lab report conducted by Caitlin Olson Blend, oh. <laughs> executed with the help of some friends, conducted June 2020. Ooh. Mm -hmm. Hypothesis. I believe that the church and worship should be a place for difficult discussions constant pondering and sharing of stories to not only educate our friends and neighbors, but to also uplift those in society who we forget about, ignore, or exclude. Moreover, I hypothesize that we can talk about polarizing topics in a healthy way to bring peace and justice to all of God's people. Through this hope, I believe we can help work through trauma deeply ingrained in the Lutheran Church. Methods. To test this hypothesis, we brought together the toughest month of worship St. John Lutheran Church has probably ever done. Maybe. We spent the month of June talking about why Black Lives Matter, how we protest, and listening to our neighbors of color. We finished the end of the month by celebrating pride in all of our lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and questioning neighbors. Sounds pretty simple, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> materials. The materials needed for this lab included history lessons, mm -hmm. excerpts from black voices, poetry, books, books from authors like our very own Lutherans, Lenny Duncan and Rosella Ide White, culturally appropriate music, questions, lots of questions, a letter from a gay man in our church, a pride flag, and a good dash of some intersectional feminist agenda. A piano, a guitar, and four leaders who care deeply about the subjects, and an audience of fellow worshipers. The result. This experiment resulted not in success, but instead in embedding a crack in our typical church system. This crack is glittered with rainbow colors and has graffitied words, Black Lives Matter, all over it. This experiment resulted in being able to say Black Lives Matter multiple times every week, bringing in words from black people whom the Lutheran Church often ignore, and this resulted in having the first pride celebration in the walls of these church for those who are beautifully and queerfully made. The best result we could have asked for came from all of you, who listened and had these conversations too. Our full results will be pending for decades to come, mm -hmm. but the experiment has started. So my conclusion, there is always more work that needs to be done. We can bring up big polarizing topics in worship and we can explore pain and celebration together. My biggest conclusion is understanding that this is what the church should be doing often. The good news of Jesus is sometimes covered by hard news. We need to be able and willing to pick up tattered rainbow flags, protesting signs, and our preconceived notions of our neighbors to see the good news. Well done. I now know what it's like to be your teacher <laughs> and for you to do better than even the teacher did. <laughs> Okay, uh, I'll share my lab report, which didn't have a title, because I did not require one, F. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my hypothesis was, I can crush all the high notes in all the music. 
haven't tested that one. Just kidding. Although yeah. I did, and uh, <laughs> stop it. A plus times a million. Okay. Uh, my hypothesis was this: simply, we can be honest. Human beings are a complex biological mass of emotions and experiences and hopes and humor and passions and fears and dreams and quirks and so much more. Worship can be the place that honestly brings together all these real human experiences in the presence of God. We tested this a lot of ways. Uh, we tested our capacity for silliness when we dressed up as Jedi and Hogwarts <laughs> professors again one thing that you did way more than me, even though I assigned it. I forgot about that. I did not. <laughs> we tested our capacity for empathy, especially in June, as we confessed our racism and we committed to LGBTQIA inclusion. We tested our capacity for emotional depth when we began Worship Lab by lamenting our deep pain and asking hard questions of God. We tested our capacity for aspirations and dreams uh, when we sang a song from the greatest showman and made dream boards. Again, some better than others. <laughs> I think I need to change my hypothesis. <laughs> uh, to test, uh, we tested our capacity for basic human needs uh, for food when we slurped soup live on camera. We tested our capacity for mystery when we spent 45 minutes talking about and singing about breathing. We tested our capacity for nuance when we explored the space between faith and doubt. We tested our capacity to meet people in this real world when we drove around in a car and we sang hallelujah. Here's the result. After eight months of testing, I can conclude that we we're indeed honest. We were real with one another, and we were real with God. In these worship labs, church felt honest. Worship felt honest. Over the course of this experiment, a lot of people gave us feedback that this worship lab was relevant to the real questions and issues in your lives. This feedback came from people who've been coming to St. John for decades and from folks who've never stepped in these doors. All of you found a home in this honest space. So here's my conclusion. There is no reason to pretend with God. Although we struggle to know God fully in our hearts and our lives, God knows us fully. God created us to be the unique creatures that we are. God gave us a full range of human experiences and human expressions. God sees through our veils, our performances, our costumes. God sees the real us. And God meets us in real, honest life. If it were not so, would God be born in a manger? If it were not so, would God's son hang from a cross? God's love is honest. God meets us in the church, which at its best is a gathering of real people in real walks of life, honestly seeking God's real presence in this real world. Faithfully submitted, whatever date it is today. <laughs> Good job, Joe. Let's sing together, It Is Well, in which we test the hypothesis, can I crush the high notes? <laughs> Can you call? 
this world to memory and hold on to it in your memory, we say those are things you know by heart. What do you know by heart? As early as kindergarten, my kids knew their lunch numbers by heart so they could eat. They can recite our table prayer by heart and our garage door code. You used to know phone numbers by heart before <laughs> you got a cell phone. Mm -hmm. There might be a recipe you know by heart, a song you can sing, or your junior high locker combination. And you need to know at least one password by heart. I know some scripture by heart, the Star Spangled Banner, and other songs we don't <laughs> sing before a game. What do you know by heart? God's desire in chapter 31 of Jeremiah that Carter read is for God's people to know something by heart. God wanted them to know by heart that God was their God and they were God's people. This was big news because God's people had mostly abandoned God, even betrayed God, and yet God said God would write it on their hearts, that God was their God and they were God's people so they would never forget. They would know by heart that God's grip on them could not be undone could not be undone by their waywardness. So here at this table, the Lord's table, you hear words that illustrate God's grip on you, even through our betrayal and our waywardness. Here's the story you know by heart.
In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks. He broke it, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks. He gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Let us pray the prayer you know by heart. Our Father Father in heaven, heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and and forever. forever. Amen. This is the Lord's table. You are welcome here. If you have bread and wine and someone with whom to commune, we encourage you to do that now. If you are worshiping alone, these words are for you. This is the body of Christ given for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. Amen. Amen. Our final song for Worship Lab is a song called Prayer After Communion, written by Greg La Follette. We sang a lot of Greg La Follette's songs over the last eight months, and you can find those online. I highly encourage you to listen to the whole album of Common Prayer. We'll close with Prayer After Communion. One, two, three, four, five, six. We give you thanks and praise them When we were still far off You met us in your Son and brought us home Dying and living, declaring your love We gave his praise And opened the gates of glory to us so may we who share Christ's body live His risen life. We who drink His cup bring life to others. We who the Spirit lights bring light to the world. Keep us firm in the hope. Before us, so we and all your children shall be free. And the whole world will to praise your name through Christ our Lord. Amen. So may we who share Christ's body. We who drink his cup bring life to others. We who dispel lights bring light to the world. And the whole earth live to praise your name through Christ. Amen. Amen. So may we who share 
Christ's body, live his risen life. We who drink his cup, bring life to others. We whom the Spirit lights, bring light to the world. Every week since we started Worship Lab eight months ago, we began each worship with a liturgical moment called Welcome to the Wonder. This is a phrase people commonly write on cards to newborn babies mm -hmm. because there is just something really special about welcoming babies <laughs> to a life of wonder and amazement and to a life of wondering. Wondering about this vast, unfathomable creation. Wondering about the never-ending horizon of God's love. It was our hope that this little worship laboratory would be a way for us to wonder together in a very strange and difficult time. Through social upheaval, with the pandemic raging, in the middle of an election, we created this space to nurture our wonder and to encourage wondering in our world. And now our experiment is ending but our work of wonder continues. We admit there were surely times our own wondering fell short of God's big, wonderful dreams. And we also admit our own limited perspectives often excluded the wonderings of so many lives different than our own. But wonder is a work in progress, a work begun in creation and continued in us. We are free to continue this work of wonder because the Holy Spirit still blows in our midst. We do not know where she comes from or where she is going, but when we wonder, we often get caught up in her unfolding work. So welcome to being caught up in the Spirit's work. Welcome to God doing something new. Welcome to intentional being. Welcome to difficult conversations. Welcome to honest lament. Welcome to real joy. Welcome to resilient hope. Welcome, Welcome to, to the wonder. The wonder.